Well, hello, and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And I have no idea what episode number this is, Kevin, because it's been so long since we recorded one, because life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't even know how to respond. It's been it's so long. It's just time to get started again. Yes, it is. And we're, we're hoping to actually... I don't know if I should say this out loud, but if I say it out loud, we become accountable to it, right? Mm. We're, we're hoping to record several episodes this week so that we can get a little more ahead and get a little more consistent with releasing these. Uh, this is part two in our hermeneutic series, and so we are going to be talking about how we interpret, how we understand things. Now, because last episode, I almost said last week, <laughs> we titled it How to Understand the Bible, How to Read and Understand the Bible, but it was really about more than the Bible. It's it's a bigger thing than that, which is interesting because bigger than the Bible sounds like a weird thing to say to begin with. But <laughs> that is the reality um, that we are trying to express. But before we do that, a couple quick things. One, if you want to support what we do, head over to crucialproductions.org slash give or if you want to ask us a question, head over to crucialproductions.org and click the Ask a Question button or send an email to questions at crucialproductions.org. Or you can do what Jeff did, and he left a comment on our blog, which is actually where this episode was listed. And I want to share some of that comment because I think it's a really important one. So I'm going to go ahead and read what Jeff said, and then I'm going to give my thoughts on it, and then Kevin will give his thoughts on it. How's that sound, Kevin? Right. Okay. <laughs> you weren't even by your microphone. You're already like, tuning out. Great. It's like going somewhere else. Okay. Anyways, so here's what Jeff said. I stopped reading the Bible when I became a Lutheran. I was an enthusiast that read the Bible two to three times a year. Being properly taught the truth through the small catechism, I knew I would not read it again because of my wanting to interpret it into what I wanted. I've heard the word hermeneutics in Lutheran circles, but I never understood how to use it until I heard your podcast. Please continue on with the series. Uh, if, if you have a counter on how many times that episode played, you'll see that I did a marathon listening session. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, for leaving your comment, which wasn't really a question, but I wanted to bring this up because this resonated with me, particularly because I had the same experience. Like, this happened to me as well, where... As I became a Lutheran, as I really started digging into scripture and understanding that I had been reading so much of it completely wrong, it did generate a fear in me that, well, if I was that wrong, how will I ever know if I'm getting it right? So there's the temptation to just stop reading it. Or one of the things I did was, well, I'm just going to find the experts and rely on them to tell me what it means. And I'm going to trust them and not really dig into it myself. Um, I'm too much of a curious individual to let that one stand for long. So I kind of went back and it's like, no, 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 I got to do this myself. I'm, I'm too independent for that, which could be a pride sin issue working in my favor. <laughs> but the reality is this is actually a real thing that happens. I've even had this conversation with my daughter as, as we're talking about scripture things and my own family, uh, with my wife, we've had this conversation. How do you know? that you're reading it correctly. And this fear can kind of settle in where it's like, you know what, maybe I just don't want to read it at all because I could mess it up because I have messed it up so badly. I have misunderstood it so much before. So I, I want to, first of all, tell Jeff, you're not alone. This is something that does happen to individuals and myself included and others. Um, but I also want to encourage you but the reason we're doing this series is so that that doesn't happen. <laughs> we, we don't want that to happen. So, Kevin, what are what are your thoughts on on this as well? Well, I think I think all of us started out reading the Bible as sinners and therefore read it quite wrong. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, all of us can share our stories of the history of reading the Bible in our lives, whether it be someone who just thought it was a good idea and tried one day and quit five minutes later or somebody who's read it their whole life. Um, I'm one who's read it for, you know, a lot more years than I care to admit, not because of the Bible part of it, because that just means I'm old. Um, but 
<laughs> I think, you know, the first couple times I read through the Bible, I, my hermeneutic was not something I'd want to encourage other people to share. It was, it was wrong headed. It was wrong spirited. It was heading in the wrong direction. Um, but in all of these stories, what the consistent thing is that it was exactly through the reading of God's word, through the hearing of God's word, that God's been at work to bring us to the place where we're actually seeking truth and mm. don't quit. That's one of the things I keep telling people whenever I, I teach on, on reading the scriptures or, or lead a seminar on this or after a couple of retreats on it is that don't quit. Don't, don't believe that your mistakes are more powerful than God's word. Keep reading it. Yes, keep refining your hermeneutic. Keep listening to people who can help you read the scriptures according to the will of God. But don't stop reading. Just keep at it and keep seeking the truth. Um, this is not our hermeneutic. It, I, I'm not suggesting this is our hermeneutic. We'll get there. But in a very practical level, it read it. Read it, read it, read it. Now, we are, like, like Peter just said, we are doing this in order to help us all read the scriptures better. And this is now going to get into our hermeneutic. But when we say better, we don't actually mean academically better. We don't yeah. mean like a smart person would read it. When we say better, we mean according to the will of God. And I know this is, this is where it gets a little hard to distinguish hermeneutics versus kind of practical realities. But what we're, what we're trying to say is that that reading scripture is something that can be done according to the will of God or can be done in a way that isn't according to the will of God. And hermeneutics is one of the ways that we encourage each other to approach the scriptures in a way that God has invited us to approach them. And so the the point of wanting to read the scripture is that you're wanting to learn from God through his word to, to believe in him, to trust in him and to live according to his will. And that's something we want to encourage you. So keep reading it. Now, what we're going to try to do on this is to give you some very basic and, and simple things that can help you do that better. And again, but when we say better, we mean according to the way God wants according us to live, to, yeah. to read it. <laughs> so that's, that's our aim. And in the meantime, um, you don't have to wait till you get your degree to start reading, just start reading now. And, that's kind of the you know the the danger of the American idea of education or the European idea of education, however you want to trace it, is that we kind of say, well, I haven't mastered this yet, so I'm not really ready to do it. Well, that's that's not true in reading scripture. Just kind of read it, and um, you'll notice most of us grew up going to Sunday school or hearing the stories of the Old Testament from somebody in our life. And, and what happened was you, you got the content of the scripture in your brain before you had any clue on how to interpret that. And sometimes that's actually really good is just to have the basic content in your brain so that when you yeah. start talking about how to interpret it, you, you know kind of what people are talking about. So This is actually how we approach education with our children. Just teach them to memorize scripture, teach them to memorize the catechism. We're not as concerned at for a five-year-old to understand the what does this mean part of it we're more concerned with can they retain it can they think of it can they remember it can they repeat it and then anybody who has kids will know as they get older they'll start asking questions and then you get into the okay let, let's talk about what this means and so we're we're advocating for the same approach even as adults let's just keep reading it keep immersing yourself in it and then we'll come together and talk about what does this mean and let's Is that a good way of summarizing it yeah let's be really specific though when we say keep reading it um the it that we're talking about is the holy bible but we're gonna be even more specific and say the new testament if you are oh come on kevin you, are, you just want to say the gospel of john well that would be even better but <laughs> um it, in in all seriousness if if you are kind of unsure that you know how to read the bible correctly then just read the New Testament. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll get to why. We do believe the Old Testament is the word of God. We believe it's, it's efficacious and good. Um, but we also believe that reading the Old Testament correctly 
requires a little more knowledge than reading the New Testament correctly because um, the New Testament is explicitly about the death and resurrection of Jesus, whereas the Old Testament kind of takes some understanding on how to understand what's going on there in the proper way. Um, and, yeah. and that's kind of what we're going to talk about in this hermeneutics um, podcast and the system of podcasts, I guess you'd tell you it's a series, is that these hermeneutical principles will change the way that we read the Old Testament. It will change the way we read the New Testament. It will actually shape our reading of the scriptures. And what you'll see as we go through um, the Christological principle, the if you, there's different ways to talk about this, but as you read it in context, as you read it in, in its original setting, those kinds of things, it's going to help you actually see this book as a unified whole, which is the revelation of God to humanity about himself. And that's really where we're going. So we really do encourage you to read the Bible, but if you're if you're kind of not sure what we're talking about or not sure how to read it, I and I know this, this sounds weird to say it, but just read the New Testament. There's plenty <laughs> there to learn and understand. We'll get to the Old Testament later, but just just read the New Testament. Now, Kevin, you said something that was a little scary sounding, mm-hmm. and so I, I want to bring it out just in case individuals were listening and kind of got bumped by it and you said we're going to help you shape how you read it. Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly how you phrase it, but just because the one idea that I think most of us have because of our our culture that's around us that focuses on the modernist idea of objective truth or that sort of thing is this idea that I can just come to the text and read it as it is. And what you just said, that no, we're actually we actually shape the text or are shaped by it, or there's there's something else going on. There's no blank slate coming to this text and I can just read it and all I'm all I'm getting is what's there. That that can be really scary. I've had conversations with individuals where they said, I want to be able to know that what I'm reading, that I've been able to figure it out and understand it, and what I'm reading is simply what the text says, and that's it. And I, I want to be able to trust in my ability to do that. We're kind of throwing that well, out the window, aren't we? Sort of. Yeah, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves <laughs> into critical into reading theory and, and communication theory. But, but I, yeah, just, I just want to bring it up, up at the front, just mention. The one thing that we yeah. would affirm, and if you read any any work on hermeneutics and interpretation that's been written in the last you know, hundred years, you're going to read this is that the, the notion of an objective reading of text is, is literally impossible. Nobody comes to a text without some kind of presuppositions. Yeah. And so what we are doing is simply identifying the, the correct presuppositions that we bring with us as you read scripture. Um, Presuppositions are not necessarily a bad thing. Our parents teach us to have presuppositions as we go throughout this world. Um, and yeah. those presuppositions often, often keep us safe. Um, think, think about a presupposition like don't take candy from strangers. That's actually presupposing a lot. And that's a good presupposition is that strangers could be dangerous. They could be people that aren't don't have your best interests at heart, aren't actually trying to help you. They're, they might be trying to hurt you. And so you teach children this because there's a danger. Now you don't treat, you don't then grow up in a whole, in your life, never talking to a stranger again because of that presupposition, but you do learn why, why you had that presupposition and how it helped you as you interact with this world growing up. And, and it's funny because even as an adult, sometimes you kind of, we kind of say it colloquially like, well, you know, you don't take, candies from strangers and you know, like if we and it, initially you might not interact with strangers at all right, as a kid but right that uh, that hermeneutic that presupposition does help you learn gradually how to properly interact yeah and with then strangers. and then but there's still times in my life that i'm not going to take candy from a stranger um yeah. you get an email saying hey i'm from nigeria i've got four million dollars <laughs> i just want to give it to some nice guy who podcasts occasionally just send me your <laughs> right and i say well that kind of sounds like it's candy from a stranger i'm i should probably be cautious about this right yeah and so these presuppositions do actually 
help us not just as we're children, but kind of as we grow up. And and what we're saying is that as we approach a biblical text, and we're already way down the line, we, we're, we're kind of too far to even go backwards at this point, but as we approach a biblical text, we are looking at words, and words are the way that God chose to communicate with us, with us being yeah. humanity. And so the, the strangest thing about the Bible that you'll notice is that on the outside it says holy, but then when you open it, it looks like words that humans would write. <laughs> and that, and that I know we, we're kind of used to this, but that's weird, is that there is a book that claims to be holy, meaning like set apart from God, and yet when you read it, the words that I'm looking at look like kind of human words, kind of ordinary words. Um, they're not some kind of mystical language that, that doesn't make any sense outside of the Bible. Matter of fact, the one I'm mm -hmm. looking at right now is English. I do have the Greek New Testament next to me and the Hebrew Old Testament. Mine's American. Right, you get American words. It says um, New American Standard we have today. We have editing things going on, like page numbers and columns and headings, and, and it's subdivided into books and, and titles. I mean, all these things, it doesn't look very godly. It looks like a book. And so yeah. part of the reality is that it is a book with words and so we're going to read it as a book with words um and that's and that's part of the hermeneutic we're going to get it but that's that's actually kind of down the the road a little bit we're going to get there don't worry but what we yep. want to start off with today start off with now that we're 15 minutes into our podcast is <laughs> that it's been so long we kind of had to set the stage right, again got to kind of warm it feels up. like but yeah as you open the book to read it this is not a human book. This is a divine book, even though it was written by people, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so the goal of this book is not just to, to hear a nice story or to get some kind of moralistic fable or something. The goal of reading this book is to know God. And that's a strange goal for reading a book. But the reason you read the Bible is because it's about God. And so what we want to do is is somehow learn about God. Now, learn is a strange word, and I'm not necessarily meaning in an academic sense of learning, but somehow get to know who this God is. Um, people use the word relationship sometimes. People use the word get to know or trust or, or believe in, something like that. But what we, what we believe is that when we open the, the word of God, the Bible, is that the most important object of the Bible is God. And so we are going to teach you a hermeneutic that is focused on God as we read scripture. And, and not just God in a generic sense either. Well, I that's, think that, that can be a so, trap that so we fall into so as well. So here's the issue is when you start reading this word about God, it actually tells us certain things that we have to know about God just to understand how to read it, which is really strange. And one of the <laughs> one of the most important verses I want you to listen to is is in John chapter 1 verse 18 and it says this no one has ever seen God the only God who is at the father's side he has made him known and that might seem like a really weird passage to read as the beginning of a of a hermeneutical system but this is so important because the very beginning of that verse is no one has ever seen God. And when it says seen, it doesn't just mean physically seen. It actually gets the same idea as understand because at the end of the verse where it says the one who is at the father's side has made him known. That's actually the verb exegetical. Okay. So the, the verb behind the word exegetical is at the end of 118. Now I know you guys don't care. But in biblical studies, exegetical means to interpret the text and to understand what it says. So Jesus is actually going to be the one that explains God to us. That's what I was going to say. I've got the NASB, the New American Standard Bible today, and it actually translates at the end of that, he has explained him right. it actually uses the word explain. Yeah. So it's like, oh, very good. Hey, that's a nice amplification. So, so of that what we term. have being the verse is no one has seen him. 
And then the solution to that problem is to explain him. So this, this seeing is not just like some kind of physical sight. It actually is knowing, comprehending, understanding. And, and this verse is really kind of a summation of the first thing we want to talk about in hermeneutics, which is that this is a book that is all written about Jesus, that the, the whole point of scripture focuses on Jesus. Jesus, the, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, the one who died and rose, um, the one who was born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus. So Jesus Christ is the focus, he's the center, he's the goal of Scripture. And we don't say that lightly or flippantly. We mean that, and we mean that all the time. That the most important question when you're reading the Bible is, what does this passage teach me about Jesus? What does this passage say about Jesus? How does this passage point to Jesus? How is this passage fulfilled by Jesus? And and so this is really kind of the most important hermeneutic we have. It's called the Christocentricity of Scripture, that Jesus is the center of Scripture. Uh- and I just want to highlight a couple of Bible passages. I think we've probably mentioned it on the podcast before, but I just turned one page earlier in my Bible. We have Luke 24, verse 27, the road to Emmaus. And Jesus says, or well, Jesus doesn't say, but he, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures, Jesus. So um, he's, he's himself. And then, of course, we have to say John 5, 39. Well, and, and stay in Luke 24. <laughs> Okay. Um, 44. So 24, 44. And this is Jesus where he says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses oh, yes. and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So again, we have two, two places in Luke 24 where Jesus, after his death and resurrection, explains that the entire Old Testament was written about him and specifically about his death and resurrection. Okay, so now go to John 5. Yep. Do you want to read that for us, Peter? Sure. This is Jesus actually talking to the Pharisees, I believe. And he says, You search the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness of me. Okay. And it's really interesting because he actually continues... And he says, yet you refuse to come to me that you have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come to in my father's name and you do not receive me. Okay, so this is kind of the important thing is that Jesus is the one that explains, shows, reveals, speaks for God. If you want to know God, you've got to get to know Jesus. There is no and other way to know God. And it's important. I, f- I think it's important for us to actually go to Scripture. If we're going to make the claim that it's all, that Scripture is all about Jesus, it's important for us to actually have Scripture that, that backs this up. And so Jesus himself saying this, it's like, okay, I can't really think of any authority higher than that. Can you, Kevin? Right, exactly. <laughs> if Jesus himself is saying, look, this whole thing is about me. It all points to me. It's all about life in me, not life in and of itself, but life in me being in Christ. Well, if we're going to make this claim as we begin our hermeneutic series, then this, the Christological principle especially, I think it's kind of important that we should actually be able to draw it from Scripture as opposed to, hey, Kevin, this sounds like a really neat right, way to read Scripture. Fun, wouldn't it? Let's test it out and see how it works. And if at the end of it, it still holds together, we're good to go. No, we're we're not approaching it in that way. That that that's how you do like scientific theories. Right. It's like, hey, I think this might work. Let's test it out and see. Oh, it worked. Well, and oh, so nope, it didn't. And so then you you <laughs> go on to Paul and you go to First Corinthians chapter two. So Paul is an apostle, a guy who taught about God and um, was obviously the greatest missionary. He wrote thirteen books of the New Testament, and this is what he says in First Corinthians chapter two. So this, this is now an apostle talking, and he said, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
So this is Paul summarizing his entire message of what he's trying to get across as he as he preaches and goes on missionary journeys. Is It's about Jesus and him crucified. This is the point of the message. And it's not just this is the point of the Christian message or this is the point of the evangelical message or this is the point of the missionary message or this is the point of whatever message you're going to put in there. This is the point of all creation and actually the scriptures simply explain that to us as this divinely inspired word that tells us the truth about God in Christ. And that's it's trustworthy because it's telling us the truth about Jesus who is himself the truth. And and then what we get is in Paul's theology, you go to Colossians. Okay, so you go to Paul's letter to Colossians and he says some phenomenal things about Jesus. And it, there's a lot to read here, so we'll just kind of <laughs> skip ahead. But but listen to what he says about Jesus in chapter 2. So Colossians 2, my, my favorite part is really verse 9. So he's talking about Christ, and then he says this, For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Okay? And that's a huge statement. So... When we say it's about Jesus, that's not actually like a subset of it being about God. It is about God when it's about Jesus. Because in Jesus, the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Now, and that's, right there is enough yeah. to spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what that means, right? <laughs> well, and that, that's why I started off this, this particular segment now saying it's not just some generic right. concept of God. There you go. You know, is reading scripture with God being the point because that that's how you end up with, well, you know, the three Abrahamic religions. So there's there's Judaism, there's Christianity and Islam, and they're all kind of in the same family because they all believe in a monotheistic God. If 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 you forget that this that God is is very specifically revealed, has revealed himself very specifically in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, that's when you end up in some of those weird places hermeneutically. You get, you get this way hermeneutically by kind of getting drawn into this. Well, they're all basically the same thing because they're all monotheistic and they all have this. They trace their source back to Abraham. So let's see how we can make them work together. But th this is why hermeneutics is is critical. Um, Kevin, one of the things you said when Paul, uh, talking about the First Corinthians passage, when he said Christ crucified is the point of creation, I, I think that that's a huge point that we don't want to just, we don't want to miss. Right. Because once again, this goes back to why I wrongly titled our last episode the way I did, kind of on purpose, <laughs> how to read and understand the Bible, because when you understand all of creation as finding its center and purpose and focus and being in Christ, that actually changes how you understand a lot more than just God's word. Right. A lot more than just the Bible. It actually impacts how you look at everything around you. And so our series on hermeneutics right now, especially the Christological principle that we're talking about, isn't limited to scripture. It's actually going to affect a lot of other things. With with scripture being our guide to how to understand those other things. And yes. this so I'm not intending so us to get into is, those other things now. This is but we will. Yeah, and this is part of the you know, as we're as we're talking about a series, this could be the rest of our lives talking about, well, okay, that means this over here. And and that's actually right. The the world that we're welcoming everybody into and that we're jumping into headlong ourselves is the world of learning to see all of life through the lens or and I'm having a discussion with somebody else about the word lens, but, but learn to see all <laughs> of life in Christ. And yeah. what does that mean if Jesus really is the son of God who died and rose to forgive the sins of the whole world? If, if this whole creation is actually for Christ is held together by Christ and in him the fullness of the deity dwells. That changes everything, literally everything, from a yeah. conception of it being about me 
or it being about political machines or, or economies or philosophies or psychologies or other spiritualities. Now we're saying, no, none of those things, none of those things are the ultimate. All those things yeah. are actually subject to Christ. None of those things define how we look at anything else. Right. They might be subsets, but they're yeah. not the thing itself. And, and when we get into this hermeneutic of, of scripture, this is what we're going to find is that there's a lot of different things that we're going to talk about how to read different parts of scripture, different genres within scripture, different authors of scripture. But that's all a subset of reading it Christologically because yeah. every author of the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, was focused on Christ, was focused on Jesus Christ as God's definitive action to save my, mankind. And, and that's a phrase you're going to hear a lot from my mouth because it's the one that I use the most to say this, is that the point of Scripture is that Jesus Christ is God's definitive action to save mankind. And I just want you to think that through. There's a there's a ton of that statement. It's it's right now is the best summary I can come up with in my head. Um, so I'm going to keep saying <laughs> it until I come up with a better one. But Jesus Christ is God's definitive action to save mankind. And that's the entire point of Scripture. Now, I know I can hear you all from way over here. I can hear you going, what about the Old Testament? You're getting rid of the Old Testament. We're supposed to read the Old Testament, although it's just all about Jesus. And the answer is, the Old Testament is about Jesus. We're not forcing it to be about Jesus. It actually is <laughs> yeah, about Jesus. It already is. Right. Yeah. And we're simply, like Paul encourages us to, to lift the veil that is there without seeing it through, through Christ. And now that the veil is lifted and we actually see the truth of Jesus Christ, which he says in Ephesians is the mystery that was hidden from age, for ages past, but has now been revealed yeah. in these last times. So now that we know it's about Jesus, we actually are going to go back and reread the Old Testament and understand it as being about the coming Messiah, who is Jesus the Christ. Now, having said that, here's a couple more things that are just kind of a preview for the next couple of weeks coming up, is that the Christological focus of scripture is not the only principle. There are other things that we're going to bring along with that always being the primary principle as a Christological center. But the other thing we're going to do is we are going to take the Bible seriously as actual narrative history. Yeah. Now, what I mean by that is that when the Bible claims to be telling us historical events, we believe that those events actually happen to real people in history. So when it says the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years or so, we believe that there is an, actually a country called Egypt, there's actually a nation called Israel, and that at a certain time in history, about 2000 BC or so, um, the Israelites were actually physically enslaved in Egypt and God set them free from that slavery. So as we interpret this Christologically, as we interpret it pointing towards Christ, we're not denying the historicity of the events described before Christ came along. Now, as part of our hermeneutic, I think it's useful to say here that the reason we believe that there was this nation of Egypt and a nation of Israel and the nation was enslaved one by the other is actually because scripture says it. Right. And the fact that there's archaeological evidence that might seem to back it up, well, that's, that's kind of a nice thing. Sure. But that doesn't actually cause us to believe it. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because that's actually an, a hermeneutical choice on my part mm -hmm. that I understand scripture and i believe that because scripture actually says it not because science or our own history books found some way to back it up and then i look at scripture and say oh well because we actually dug up that chariot wheel right. in the red sea and it seemed to be in the right place therefore i great. know access is true yes yeah. therefore it's true Th this is actually a hermeneutical issue that we don't understand scripture because we find history and science that backs it up, we actually believe it because of who it points and, to first. Yes, and and second of all, and be because it is a reliable ancient text. And that's, that's yeah. part of us believing that the Bible is true 
is that now we are looking at ancient texts that actually tells us, like I said before, the actual events that occurred in history. So Peter is exactly right. The fact that archaeology backs it up is kind of like, well, for us, for me, it's kind of like, well, duh. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's not. Oh, they finally found it. Took them long more enough. More believable now because they found, like you said, a chariot wheel or a, you know, tell Dan Stell yeah. or something like that that mentions David or something like that. You know, those things we expect them to find because it's true, but they aren't why we believe the Bible to be the word of God or to be true. And we'll talk about all these things as we go. We'll talk about historicity. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about reliability. We'll talk about inspiration. We'll talk about truth. We'll talk about what does it mean that it's the word of God. We'll talk about human authorship and divine authorship. But, but what I want to get to kind of before all that is that as we simply read the text, we are reading it Christologically, but we're also reading it as though it had true meaning in its original setting. And, and that's an important thing is because we're mm -hmm. not suggesting reading Genesis as though it's actually just a bunch of trick statements that nobody could comprehend until Jesus came along and then we went, oh, well, that's what that means. No, it actually made yeah. sense to the original hearers in its original setting. We, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode regarding Revelation. Right. Because that one's always, always some the book kind of, where it's like, right. oh, but I, okay, I think that's crazy. an important thing, too, is that we're going to make sure that when we read Scripture, it is always pointing to Christ, and it makes sense in its original context and its original setting, and... The other concept that we're going to bring into this, so there's kind of a, a twofold thing under the Christological concept, which is it's going to make sense in its original setting, original context, but it's also going to make sense in the whole story. So we're not mm. going to have any outliers where all of a sudden, like Peter was alluding to earlier, where all of a sudden there's another God out there that's equally <laughs> worshipfully you know, worthy of something. Um, so that's... Muhammad's God, Allah, or something like that. We're not going to do that. Yeah. No, the the message of Scripture is actually a unified message, and it all points to the same God because there's only one true God, and that God is known in in Jesus Christ. And that's we're going to so we're going to keep it together, right? So we're going to read it mm -hmm. Christologically. We're going to read it believing that it made sense in an original historical setting, and we'll talk about what that means. But we're also going to read it believing that there is a unified whole to this book. You're not going to get any strange stories that point to a different direction or a different way of salvation or a different means of grace or a different God. Okay, and that's, and, believe it or not, that's very important to say and harder and that, to practice than you think. Yeah, and that unified whole, what's the phrase you, you like, Kevin, that, it's the best one you've found to express so far. You just said it in this episode. So God's definitive or Jesus Christ is God's definitive action to save mankind. Yeah. And that's the crucial conversation. That's why we're doing a series on hermeneutics is so that we can help you understand that. And Kevin, because we're crucial productions, we want people to be able to pass it on. Yes. Right. It's not just a, Hey, here's for you. We want you to be able to pass it on. And so as part of that, well, it helps if you understand what we're saying. So hopefully, we I don't think we've made this episode academic. I don't think we made the last one too academic. We want to keep that going so that this is accessible to just about anybody. Um, I my One of my daughters actually enjoys listening to our podcast, which is kind of weird as her dad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, Dad, I listen to your podcast. Oh, cool. okay. I think. Thanks. But the point being, we, we want this to, to be accessible. So... If we say anything that's confusing or you want more clarification, you want us to dig deeper on, we, we want to know. Um, so please do send in those questions. Send those in. We do have a backlog of questions from previous episodes we've done. So at some point in the series, we'll actually take a break and handle those questions and answer those for you guys as well. I, um, I think one thing I would also like to say, because this is such an important yes. topic and people kind of do get very nervous about some of these thus these things is that nothing we are saying is new or novel everything we are saying has been said by confessional lutheran theologians it has been said by the christian church throughout history i promise we do not want to be novel 
We are not yeah, seeking be, to, to blaze new ground Saying something here. new is we bad. We do not want to do that. As a matter of fact, <laughs> um, whenever I have a thought, I often... I open books and read. What do the Lutheran fathers tell us? What does the history of the church told us? How does this does this play out in Scripture? Does this play out in the history of the of the confessions? And so, um, we invite all questions because of that. So yeah. please, we 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 would love for you to write and say you said this. Could you? I don't understand it, or it freaks me out, or whatever. Please explain it more. We'd be happy to do that. Um, yep. we do the same thing to our, each other. We'll, we'll talk and then we'll say, you know, where are you getting that from? Let's, let's look it up and make sure this is the right thing to believe the right thing. Kevin, and, that sounded crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. What'd you get that from? What's, and yeah. again, when we say right, when we say right or orthodox or true, we are meaning according to God's will. That's our desire. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, at the beginning of the episode, I told you guys how to send in those questions. Please do that. You can find us on social media as well. Until then, we'll see you guys next time. See ya.